Welcome to Chapter 60 of the Kinsman Die Podcast, home of fantasy fiction based on Norse mythology that's written and read by me, Matt Bishop. In this podcast, I read my first novel, Kinsman Die, one chapter at a time. And with each episode, when it makes sense, I provide some commentary about the source materials I've referenced in the text. Last week was the one-year anniversary of this podcast. Thank you for continuing to listen. There are 93 chapters in Kinsman Die, so we're nearly there. And as you might expect, events will start coming to a head right about now. This week, we're back with Vathrudnir. It's been quite a while since we were with him. He'd been with the apprentice shaman Kali, and then he'd gone through the doorway that Beli and the warband Helvig found within the snow bear nest. Let's rejoin him now. Chapter 60, Vathrudnir. An arrowhead of black clouds, lightning flickering among them, hurtled toward the Jotun village where he'd hoped to rest for the day. Vathrunir spread gray wings and launched himself back into the air. Several nights earlier, when he was with Helveg, he had stepped through a doorway into a distant land wrapped in a deep winter, just like Utgard. But that land appeared fertile, unlike Utgard, where only dwindling patches of healthy land still existed. Lightning flashed. And so it appeared that Yig had sent the Thunderer against them, as expected. And of course, his own route back to Helveg happened to cross the town Thor had chosen to destroy. After he'd used the stars to locate the doorway's distant exit, many of the stars were unfamiliar, but others were not. And after he'd explored the immediate vicinity, he stepped back through into Utgard, then flew back toward Jotunheim to meet up with Helveg, which had led him here. Thunder rumbled toward him, cartwheels against stone. If he hurried, he might still help the villagers to safety. But he was too late. Smoke's black curls were already rising above the trees. Thunder gnashed the air like a goat's teeth above the peak into which the villagers had driven their mine shafts. He could just make out the thunderer, made small by the distance astride his flying cart with the storm dragging along behind him like a whipped hound. Lightning blasted from the Thunderer's upraised fist. A dozen ragged tendrils of fire leaped into the forest below his circling cart. The crash of the sky reached Vathru near a dozen heartbeats later. At the smell of burning wood, he knew he needed to take shelter somewhere. He folded his wings and dove toward the snow-laden treetops below, then toward the valley's walls, hoping to find a boulder or cave. Dry as it was, even with the snow, the forest would not be safe. The sky flickered and thunder crashed again, the sound bouncing off the valley's walls. Then he was blinded by a brilliant flash of white light. A heartbeat later, the air convulsed and flung him downward, tumbling. Instinctively, he shapeshifted into a long-armed, brown-haired creature like those he'd seen in Alfheim. His vision cleared in time to glimpse the bare forest below, branches rattling against each other like bones, approaching too quickly. The air roared past him, hot, wet, and filled with debris. He was cut a dozen times, legs, chest, arms, and blood flowed. He slammed into the rough bark of a tree limb. It snapped, and he fell further. But dragging leathery hands and feet against the trunk, he slowed enough to drop to all fours on the forest floor. The frozen ground twitched and flicked him off like a cow did a fly. Another violent crash rolled over him. He leaped back into the trembling trees, climbing fast. Another crash, sullen and rumbling. He was high enough now to look toward the village. Dust hung in the air even as a cloud roiled toward him, faster than he could think. He wrapped himself around the opposite side of the tree, putting what little protection he could between himself and the cataclysm, and hung on. It hit like a sea wave, but gritty and dry. He felt the tree break, and then he was tumbling backward with it, hoping he would live. Don't worry, his Fulga whispered just as he sank beneath the wave. He could tell his body was moving, but he wasn't in control, and he thrashed. Stop that, his Fulga whispered. I'm getting you to a safer place where you can watch what's happening. What is happening? Look. High above them, Thor rode in his cart, pulled by two shaggy, longhorn goats. The wheels and hooves clattered and rumbled like the wagons across a stone bridge. 
Vathrudnir's eye was drawn to Thor's right fist, held high where his hammer glowed as hot and red as if recently plucked from a forge. Thor flung Mjolnir downward. Vathrudnir traced the arc. It was easy to do. Mjolnir hurtled like a burning arrow toward the dominant peak behind the village. It had been a peak. Now it was a broken tooth. The hammer shot through the heavy hanging dust and grit and turned it a brighter red than even Muspel's sparks during the rising. Its arc was impossibly slow. An ingot gripped in tongs, brought from forge to quenching bucket. Just before Mjolnir finally struck, Vathrunir squeezed his eyes shut. White light pressed against his lids, the earth thrashed in agony, and his fulgia again took control of his body. She dropped him below the forest's shattered remains, faster than he could have moved on his own, and took shelter beneath the debris of ancient oaks and fir trees and broken boulders. The roaring wave passed overhead. The earth's twitches slowed. Thor had just leveled a mountain. Framed against a gritty sky, the Thunderer rumbled about the remains of the mountain and, presumably, the devastated village nestled at its base. Were the villagers all dead, then? With each slow circle, the wind from the Thunderer's passage beat down the cloud of dirt and smoke. The hooves of the goats pulling his cart added their own smithy din to the sky, while lightning flickered like sullen children banished to a hall's darker recesses cold rain fell. Thor himself became visible, chest and shoulders wide above the bronzed rim of the cart. His red hair streamed out behind him, Mjolnir held at arm's length a white-hot ingot that steamed as the rain hit it. Abruptly, the Thunderer turned his cart south and rumbled away. Yet his storm remained, along with all the ruins Vathrudnir must now investigate. Well, folks, that was chapter 60 of Kinsman Die. I hope you enjoyed it. Thor broke a mountain and presumably destroyed a Jotun village in retaliation for the Jotun's surprise attack on Halls. This is the fruition of Odin's threat many chapters ago. This chapter wasn't strictly necessary, but I needed a way to bring Vathrudnir back into the narrative, and I also wanted to illustrate the power difference between the Asir and Jotun, and I wanted to follow up on that threat that Odin had I also wanted to include the real Thor, not the, no offense, silly version he became in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. For me, Thor is a force of nature. He is the son of Jord, Earth, and Odin. He is Odin's firstborn son. In the myths, Odin and Thor have a contentious relationship, which I tried to illustrate during the Ithaval scene. Thor's main job among the pantheon of Aesir gods is to kill Jotun. He is usually out east, quote-unquote, doing just that, battling and killing Jotun. I described Thor as he is in the myths, big, red-haired, and red-bearded. One of his major attributes, of course, is his hammer, Mjolnir, which was made by two Svartalvar. In the myths, they are typically referred to as dwarves. They are named Sindri and Broker. Mjolnir exists because of Loki, and despite Loki's efforts to sabotage its creation. Mjolnir's handle is too short. That's one of the details Marvel actually got right. Mjolnir produces thunder and lightning. If thrown, it returns to Thor's hand. To wield it, Thor wears iron gauntlets to protect his hands. Thor also wears a belt. I pictured it as a smith's leather apron because he needs something to protect himself from a superheated Mjolnir. That belt doubles Thor's already prodigious strength. He rides in a cart pulled by two goats, Tooth Nasher and Tooth Grinder. The rattle and bang of the cart's wheels also produce lightning and thunder, as do their hooves and the gnashing and grinding of their teeth. In the myths, Thor's capabilities are a bit kind of all over the place, from fishing up and wrestling with the world serpent, to drinking an entire sea, to losing all his strength when his hammer is stolen. Loki helps Thor get his hammer back, and in the myths, Loki and Thor are often depicted in each other's company. And in the Lokasena, Loki says that Thor is the only Asir whose word he respects. But as much as this chapter includes Thor, and before a few revisions, there was much more in this book that did include Thor, 
This chapter is really about Vathurnir and his reaction to Thor. As I said, I was trying to establish the power differential between Asir and Jotun, and to show why the Jotun are attacking from the proverbial shadows. This chapter also contrasts the partnership between Vathurnir and his Fulgia versus the adversarial relationship between Vidar and his, and Odin and his Fulgia. We know that Odin has a Fulgia. He lost control of it way back when he fought the Thing in the Well, and then he, Odin, attacked Frigg. I mention this because this theme will reoccur both in this book and in the next two. I've also written a novella which follows a couple Jotun characters. It's finished, but kind of not. I haven't decided what I'll do with it. Regardless, some of the events in that novella correspond with what happens in this chapter. Basically, there's a Jotun warband that is present inside the mountain while Thor is circling the mountain and then ends up destroying it. And incidentally, I've also written most of a novel with Sindri and Broker as the main characters, as well as Vathrunir. But all that is neither here nor there, at least for now. Next week, we're back with Hodor. Until then, if you have the time and inclination, please rate or review the podcast. that helps boost the show's visibility, as does sharing it. As always, I'm going to read from both the Bellows and Larrington translations of the Havamal. Bellows, verse 60. Of seasoned shingles and strips of bark, for the thatch let one know his need. And how much of wood he must have for a month, or in half a year he will use. Larrington, verse 60. Of dry wood and thatching bark, a man can know the measure. And of the wood which can get one through a quarter or a half year. Thanks for listening.